Good evening, everyone. Well, uh, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed the, the meal and the service tonight. Um, if you appreciate it, would you please give a uh, round of applause to the staff of the Henry? Uh, I'm very excited to have tonight's speaker with us, and uh, I think you will be too. We've heard a lot of mixed messages about the state uh, of uh, the economy and the future, your future uh, in the American uh, workforce. And today I think we're going to have a message of optimism. We're going to see uh, what has been done elsewhere and what is possible uh, possibly to, to uh, implement here in the United States. And uh, I'm going to ask our distinguished president, uh, Keith Pretty, to introduce tonight's guest. Would you please come up here, Dr. Pretty? Well, thank you, Dr. Matchek, and good evening. It's great to have you all here, and it's nice that. Uh, uh, some of us who have had a busy day elsewhere were able to join you for this evening's program, which, like Dr. Matchek, I think you're going to enjoy and, and learn a great deal from our guest speaker this evening. Before I introduce our guest speaker, let me also introduce to you another very special individual that is here in the room this evening, has just joined us and is going to stay for the rest of the seminar, as I understand it, this weekend. That's a member of our Board of Trustees. Dr. Patricia Nagley, right up here in front. Pat, if you would say hello. <laughs> Pat and her late husband um, have been caring for and assisting and, and providing uh, for Northwood students virtually since Northwood University came to Midland, Michigan. So um, she is one of the real great resources in our university, and I hope over the course of the weekend you'll take the time to, to get to know her. Well, it's my privilege to introduce to you our, our guest speaker this evening. The Honorable Maurice Matig is the Vice President and Visiting Scholar at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University in, uh, in Northern Virginia. He's the Director of the Mercatus Center's Government Accountability Project and a member of its Spending and Budget Initiative and its State and Local Policy Project. He joined the Mercatus Center in 1997 where he has served as, as an advisor to the Office of Management and Budget and most federal agencies, ironically, during both the Clinton and the George W. Bush administrations. He's consulted with legislators and governors in over 20 different states in the United States, and in 2003 was appointed to the Office of Personnel Management Senior Review Committee, which was formed to make recommendations for the new human resources systems at the then newly created Department of Homeland Security. Matigue in the Mercatus Center has served as special advisors to Louisiana's Commission on Streamlining, Govern Streamlining, Streamlining Government, uh, and in 2010, he was named to Virginia Governor Bob McConnell's Commission on Government Reform and Restructuring. A seasoned expert on government reform, Dr. Matigue brings practical experience and scholarly research to the table from his distinguished career as a former cabinet member and a member of parliament in his home in New Zealand, where apparently he's headed back home in the coming week. Holding seven different ministerial portfolios during his nine years in the New Zealand parliament, Matigue is one of the architects of the New Zealand miracle, which dramatically reformed that country's government and economy by implementing market-driven pro-growth policies. A farmer by trade, Matigue served in New Zealand's parliament from 1985 to 1993 before becoming the country's ambassador to Canada. And in a ceremony at Buckingham Palace in 1999, Queen Elizabeth II bestowed upon Mr. Matigue the prestigious Queen's Service Order in recognition of his public service, one of the highest honors attainable for any civil servant in New Zealand. Let's please have a warm Northwood welcome for Dr. Maurice Matigue. <laughs> Dr. Petty? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petty, and uh, thank you to Northwood for the invitation to be here. Uh, 
I've been to Michigan on a number of occasions, but this is the first time that I've been to Dearborn. Except as a child growing up in New Zealand, nearly every tractor at that time in New Zealand was built by International Harvester, and on the side of it it would have Dearborn, Michigan, which in those days I had no idea where it was, but I do now. I want to start by um, drawing your attention to the banner over here and it talks about the Freedom Seminar. And I want to just echo some of the things that were said last night by Dr. Michael Cox about the importance of freedom. How many people in the room have ever looked at uh, the Economic Freedom Index? And there's a number of them. Okay, if you're a student and you haven't, Google it and have a look. Uh, they are put out by a number of different organizations. My reason for raising that is that we can see from those indexes which have been in place for 20 and 30 years that there is a direct relationship between freedom and prosperity. The least free countries in the world are the poorest and the most free countries in the world are the richest. So if I were to say to you how many of you know of a country called Zimbabwe? Okay. How many of you know what its name was before it was called Zimbabwe? A lot less people. It was called Rhodesia. And it was considered to be the Garden of Eden of Southern Africa. It was one of the most affluent and prosperous parts of Southern Africa. And in the last 30 years, it has been totally destroyed to become the least free and the one of the poorest places in Africa. And I just want to remind you of that, that freedom is something that we shouldn't take for granted, that it can easily be lost. And the consequences of losing it are catastrophic for the people who live there. You see, in our own personal lives, Prosperity is very directly linked to how much freedom we have, where we can go for our holidays, what school we can go to, what things that we can do, what we can do for our children. So pursuing prosperity, in my view, is very important. Over the next year, everyone in this room, no, not the next year, over the next six months, everyone in this room is going to get pounded by a lot of uh, commentary about the things that lead to prosperity, much of which is going to be wrong. And if I were to give you uh, my take on this situation, it is this. There is a very simple prosperity equation, and it is this, that investment occurs Jobs are created, prosperity follows. It never, ever changes. Let me give you just a very simplistic example. If you owned a small bookstore and it was an owner-operator with no staff and you found that your customers were waiting longer and longer at the checkout counter, to the point where you were losing some of them, you would have to start to consider employing somebody else. But before you employed that additional person, you would have to buy another cash register, you would have to put in some additional counter space, you would have to put in some additional bookshelves, you would have to buy some additional books. That's the investment that's necessary before the job has occurred. So the jobs equation is really very simple. Those places that make it most attractive for investors to come or current investors to stay will win this war. And those who make it less attractive will lose. And we need to keep that in mind, that that simple equation about what are the things that are likely to chase our investors away uh, are things that we should be concentrating on. 
if I look at the state of Michigan, I see that this is how you rank in terms of the ease of doing business. Now, Alec gives you a pretty good ranking, but the CEO magazine and Forbes give you a pretty poor ranking. I think it will be better next year because some of the things that you've done recently haven't fed through yet. But what that really means is that there are many things that you need to do to make it more attractive for business to come. If you look at some of the dissatisfiers for business investment, one of the biggest of those is uncertainty. If you are slow to make decisions, or you make temporary decisions, or you don't make them clearly, then investors are going to go somewhere else. The biggest barrier to investment is uncertainty. That's one of the reasons why we see corporate America right now at this time sitting on $2.2 trillion in cash in their balance sheets. And they're holding it there because they don't know what the tax regime is going to be a year from now, and they don't know what the regulatory regime is going to be. Even though the law called Dodd-Frank has been passed, nobody knows exactly what the regulations are going to say. So they're sitting on that cash. If that cash was out there earning, then the American economy would be much more dynamic than it is right now. Even facing the kind of uncertainty that's coming out to Europe, of Europe that's helping to uh, fuel that uncertainty, if in America it was more certain, we'd be growing at 3 to 3.5% three in my view, instead of 1.5 to 2%. Interestingly, Unless America grows at 3% per annum, it is not growing fast enough to actually create the jobs necessary to soak up the new employees coming into the marketplace. And the level of employment will stay static or get worse unless you can grow at a rate greater than that 2%, uh, that, uh, greater than 2% uh, and closer to 3%. So that's important. Can places change? And the answer is yes. And what makes the difference? In my view, the difference is leadership. Are there leaders out there that are prepared to attack the problems that exist at the moment, regardless of the political consequences, and take their states forward? If you look at this, uh, this index here, you will see that in the biggest improvers category, you've got places like Indiana, and if I went back five years, Indiana would be in the bottom 25, somewhere around about 35 or 37. And now it's up to number six. That's because the governor there has led Indiana to make decisions that his predecessors would never have thought about. Controversial decisions that have put it in a position where it's starting to create wealth and jobs. Not far from here, you could say the same thing about the governor of Wisconsin, but then you look at the other side of the ledger, and it's not here in the biggest losers for 2010, but Illinois in the last five years has managed to go from number eight in terms of its attraction for business investment to number 48. Some five years, a loss of 40 places. So bad decisions quickly take you down. Uh, on the prosperity ladder. Were, that, were they important decisions? Were they massive decisions? No, in most cases they were cumulatively a number of small decisions that deteriorated the attraction for investment coming in. One of the indexes that I use a lot, and I recommend to you in your studies to have a look at it, is something that's put out by the World Bank and it's called the International Ease of Doing Business Index. And one of the interesting things that you can do with that is look at some of the small things that places are doing to make it more attractive. For example, one of the things that they measure is how long it takes to be able to register a security against the title of property or to register a change in the title of property. If you went back about five years, 
the average was about 35 days. In my own country in New Zealand, it now takes one hour. But in some places like Zimbabwe, it takes five years. No investor is going to wait for five years to be able to make that investment. Cash sitting idle is money lost. And it's not going to happen if you have those kind of encumbrances. Just things like, not the tax rate, as you've got a lot of good information about today, but the complexity of the system. How long does it take a small business each year to be able to comply? Most countries at the moment can do that now at about 150 hours per annum for a small business. But there are some places where it takes about 3,000 hours per annum to be able to do that. It's not about the rate. It's about the complexity of all of the different procedures that people have to go through. Getting rid of those is not that difficult. These are decisions that lawmakers can make without actually having to make monetary decisions about whether they increase or decrease expenditures. It's a matter of focusing on what's going to win us investment. Now I want to talk about labour markets. And most people have, at the very best, a, very, a, a rather tenuous view of what a labour market is. Labour markets are the biggest markets in our economy. It's the place where we trade our skills and our time for financial reward. They are things that are competitive right across the world. You are not competing with the state next door. You're competing with Taiwan, you're competing with China, you're competing with India, you're competing with Hong Kong and Singapore and every other, um, every other country on earth. Because today, labor is about as fungible as finances. It can move instantaneously. It's not easy to see, though, because what you see in labor markets is that it's the new jobs that go somewhere else rather than the existing jobs. Instead of growth in your particular locality, the growth goes somewhere else. And what's that looking for? It's actually looking for a whole range of things that lead to making labor markets more competitive. If you ignore that, you go into the doldrums and the prosperity of your community goes downhill. I want to talk about a few of the things that actually affect that competition. Uh, probably everybody in the room has heard of somebody called Joe Coors. He's the guy who founded Coors um, breweries. For a long period of time during his life, he had a, a major battle with the unions about wages and about whether or not his company could really afford to pay higher wages. And what he used to say to his, the unions was that you don't understand the hidden costs that an employer has to bear uh, that aren't reflected in the wage packet that goes to your members. So one of the things that he did was that he decided to try and get this message through was that he was going to pay all of his employees their gross wage in cash. And when they received their gross wage in cash, they had to go to the next window and pay back in cash their federal taxes. And then they had to pay back their state taxes. And then they had to pay back their unemployment insurance. And then they had to pay back their health care premiums. And all of a sudden, a big bundle of money like that had started to dwindle. And they got the message about what the costs were that were hidden that maybe were depressing their wages. Uh, and that's a very important consideration because it's those costs that are often lost to us. So here's something taken from the state of Pennsylvania. This is somewhere around the median wage. The gross wage of that individual would be $45,000 per annum. They would have to pay FICA uh, of $2,500. They would have to pay federal withholding taxes of $2,400. They'd have to pay uh, Pennsylvania State withholding of $1,381 and a few other ancillary things. And in the end, they get $38,000 out of their forty-five. dollars 
So those are costs that the employee is bearing that's diminishing the wage that they were paid. This is what the employer's costs are. He's got to pay a gross wage of $45,000. He doesn't get the current rebate or reduced tax on FICA, so he pays $3,400. He's got to pay for health insurance, about $21,000. He has to pay for unemployment, um, the state unemployment um, fees of $214, the federal unemployment, $56. So the employee's cost to the company is 70000 If there's also a pension contribution, the employer's costs now are about 81000 So if you look at that in Pennsylvania, the cost of employing somebody is 216% of the take-home wage of that employee. 216%. Is gone. Those are wages that weren't available to the employee, but they're part of the cost of doing business. I go backwards and forwards to Europe quite a bit. I've done quite a lot of work with some of the countries coming out of communism in Eastern Europe. The cost of employing somebody in Germany, in say Westphalia, at the moment is 225% of the wage paid. The cost of employing somebody in Slovakia is 115% of the wage paid. There are now more German cars made in Slovakia than there are made in Germany. That's the kind of competition that we're facing, and that competition is being driven by the mandates placed by governments on employers that they have to pay, and that becomes a cost of the goods that they're paying out, uh, sorry, the goods that they're producing and trying to compete in the world market with. We have to be very careful about those mandates. Part of my experience in the government in New Zealand was that I was Minister of Labour and we reformed the labour markets. In reforming the labour markets, the unions no longer were the negotiator for many of their members, that people decided to negotiate on their own. What we actually found was that negotiating on their own, many employees were quite happy to take a 4 or a 5 percent increase in salary now rather than have the protection of a severance payment if they might get laid off. In other words, the deals that were being negotiated for them were not the things that the employee valued most. They would rather have had cash now than have the potential of that cash at a later date. I'm going to move somewhere else. Uh, this is a quote from Milton Friedman, who's one of my favorite economists. One of the greatest mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results. And I'm going to focus a little bit here on things that help people to get back into work. And we think that having a program that helps unemployed people get back into work is a good thing to do and we should fund it. Well, that's not good enough because financial resources are a scarce commodity. And what we should actually know is that if the program we're funding is actually successful at getting people into work, because you can measure things like efficiency, but efficiency is valueless unless you first have effectiveness. So is it actually doing the job that you want it to do? Here's something that we put together based on some of the experiences of the government in New Zealand, and we put it together at the Makeda Centre. And what it really does is say that governments should start to look at what they do through this lens. The first thing is that you identify what the outcome is that you're trying to achieve. And in very simple terms, outcomes are what's the public benefit that you're trying to achieve. So it's homeless people placed in homes. It's unemployed people back in the workforce. It's uneducated people educated. Those are the kind of things that we call outcomes. So you have to identify the outcome first. Then you have to look at how many organizations you have that are addressing this problem. And you've got to consider a government as the owner of those organizations and whether the owner wants to have many organizations doing that or one organization specializing in it. If it was in the private sector, we'd have one organization specializing in it. 
Then you have to look at how many tools they have that they're using for that purpose. Those are called programs. You should then look at the results. You should then look at what's the cost and what's the benefit. You should then look at what would happen if we reallocated those monies to the best options. And then we would be able to identify what's the opportunity cost of doing this badly. So we did this study a few years ago and it looked at vocational training programs in the United States. And what it did was sort of try and find the, how you would fund the best option and what the results would be. So we found that of the things that there were identifiable measures or data for, we found 45 programs. There were many more, there were about 110. The rest of them had zero data that was of any use. So you got the Labor Department had 16, Education Department had 11, and others had smaller uh, levels of operation. First question you've got to ask is, why so many agencies doing it? And the answer is, that's what's called mission creep. Agencies want to spread out to be able to create a bigger empire. So they get into activities that actually belong to somebody else, and every now and again you have to go back and say as the owner, I'm going to return you to your core business. When you look at the cost of these programs, and I know this is a complex, um, a, a complex slide, the first column of numbers is actually the total quantity of money spent. The second column of numbers is how many people you can place into work for a million dollars. And you'll see that for the first program, uh, School to Work, you can place 1,729 people into work for a million dollars. And the bottom one there, trade effective workers, you can place 34 people into work for a million dollars. Or expressed in a different way, for the first program it costs $578 to place somebody into work, and for the trade effective workers it costs nearly $30,000 to place somebody into work. Frankly, you'd be better to give them the $30,000 and say have a good time. But that, you've got to have that data to start to weigh those things up and say, how can we do that better? Well, in total, the federal government spent $8.2 billion on those programs, and they got 2.8 million people into work. If you put that money, that $8.2 billion, into the three best programs, you would actually get 14.2 million people into work as opposed to 2.8. What that means is that 11 million people didn't get jobs because you spent the money badly. So that's the opportunity cost. 11 million people didn't get jobs because you stayed with the status quo. Or if you took it another way and said, let's maintain the current public benefit of 2.8 million people into work, and you used your best tools, you could free up $6.4 billion to spend somewhere else. This is something that we've done in a number of places around the world, and the orders of magnitude remain pretty much the same. There is gross levels of inefficiency because nobody actually goes through and costs things out and decides which is the best tool I have in my toolbox uh, because everybody funds programs rather than funding results. Nobody will actually recognize this building um, because this is actually the Parliament of New Zealand. I'm going to change tack here because I'm going to talk about something slightly different. And what I'm going to talk about is if you're going to reform government, you have to think about the things that government is doing and whether or not those things are truly the tasks that government should be involved in. Well, in my view, uh, the government doesn't need to be involved in construction because there are tons of construction companies in the private sector that should buy those goods and services from the private sector. It doesn't need to be involved in engineering for exactly the same reason. It doesn't really even need to be involved in licensing. It can set the criteria and it can let somebody else do that. I'll come back to that shortly. Forestry work, exactly the same sort of uh, issue. You can commission other people to do that. Or even delivery of welfare. People like uh, the Salvation Army and St. Vincent de Paul and all sorts of private sector volunteer groups do a better job of delivering welfare than government operated organizations. So, 
One of the things that we did in my country was that we started to look at government operations and we looked at them through the lens of what is your core business and what are the things that you should actually do and if these are things that you shouldn't do we would just cut that away. So in the Department of Transportation they had 5,600 people working there and when we pruned away the unnecessary activity and the things that could be done in the private sector there were 53 people. When we did the same to the State Forest Service, it went from 17,000 people to 17. And part of that was because we actually had a different idea about how you actually sold government trees to the private sector for milling. We used to sell mature trees on the basis of something like a four or a five year cutting contract. What that did was create incentives for the private sector to take the maximum value in the shortest period of time. But what we didn't get was the investment that was necessary to create further added value to that product. So what we did was that we sold the forests for the next 100 years, a cutting rate for 100 years instead of five. Now all of a sudden we got further investment in adding value. So prior to this, a cubic meter of timber, normally exported with the bark on it, was worth $200. But if you converted that into dimension products, which are the kind of things that you see as the framing around doors and all of the artificial woodwork and so forth around us, it went from $200 a cubic meter to $2,800 a cubic meter. And by doing this, the value of our timber exports went up fourfold. Plus, we increased the number of people employed in that industry by just on 30%. So the 17,000 people I got rid of were more than gobbled up, gobbled up by this increased activity because now we had invest in investment adding further value. So it's about thinking smart. One of my departments was the Department of Public Works, just a construction company. Uh, so we decided that we weren't in the construction business. We got out of it, went from 28,000 people to one. That was me. And I was just there to sign papers. But what we actually found was that when the government specifies a construction project, like a new school, a hospital, a bridge, the government is necessarily very cautious about making a mistake. So it tends to over-specify all of those activities and make them more expensive. We got 40% more activity for the same quantity of money and 20% more people working in that construction se sector than before by just shifting that to where it probably should have been always in the private sector. Over the entire government, that shrank our government workforce uh, from 96,000 people to 32,000 people. Those people didn't get laid off. Yes, they got laid off from, from the government but the new activity created more jobs than they were there before. We went from 11% unemployment down to 3% unemployment by following this course of action. So these are kind of smart thinking that we need if governments are going to do a better job of creating a climate for prosperity. I'm going to switch course again here. I'm going to talk about schools. My experience in the United States is that everybody is excited about the poor performance of public schools. Uh, and then the first thing they do is attack teachers. But I think that's the wrong course. I don't think you should be attacking, attacking teachers. I think you should be actually attacking the governance of the schools. Because if the teachers are doing, the bad, are doing a bad job, then the governance of the schools is doing a bad job. So if we thought about that differently, and let's think about who are the consumers of education, and frankly it's not children because they're just too young, it's actually the parents of children. And what we should do is actually think about putting the parents in control of that process. Treat them as the consumers, treat schools as the providers. Give parents control over the decision making and accept that it's a parental right to actually decide where your child goes to school. In my view, nobody whether it's government or anybody else, has the right to make you send your child to a bad school. Nobody.
So the obvious solution is that they have to allow you to choose. And if you choose, then a number of things are going to happen. So how do we actually do that? What we did was that we said that in future, to give parents the control over what happens in school, every school is going to be governed by a board of trustees. That board of trustees is going to be elected by the parents of the children who go to that school and nobody else gets a vote. Just the parents of the children who go to that school. We will then block fund that school based on counting how many children are there. If the school has more children, they will get more money. If they have less children, they will get less money. So what actually happens is that in the environment of the school and inside the teacher's common room, there is quite vibrant discussion that occurs about who was it that lost that family of children. And the response is, whoever it was that lost them should be the first teacher to go. And in a very short period of time, we saw the differential between public and private schools in terms of educational attainment disappear. It took about 30 months for it to disappear. We fund public and private schools in exactly the same way because we consider that the government is buying educational services, not giving preferential treatment to some educational services over others. We used to be about 17 or 18 percent behind our international peers in educational achievement. We're now about 15 to 17 percent ahead. And it all came about by saying, we actually need to give the people who are the consumers of education some say over how it happens. How many people think that's actually a radical change? Okay. Well, you know, it's not. It actually goes back to how education started. It was started normally by parents who would get together and hire a teacher. They would build a school and they would start to teach children and some who couldn't afford to go to school would be paid for by others. And it's only a relatively recent innovation that we've decided that we would have bureaucracies that run schools instead of parents. So I'm actually telling you that we should go back to where we were in the past rather than do something that's radically different. But whether you consider it's radical or not, what's important is, does it work? One of the things that we found when we looked at how education money was spent was that for every dollar spent on education, in our case, 66 cents got spent outside the classroom and 33 cents inside. It was absorbed in administration and all sorts of outside the classroom activities. We decided that had to change. And the public decided that as well. Because when we told them that number, they were appalled. So by getting rid of all of the education boards and all of the school boards and all of those things, we just legislated them out of existence. And we converted every school in the country to this new system on the same day. We were able to reverse that equation so that two-thirds of the money got spent inside the classroom. In my view, that's one of the reasons why we are seeing the improvement in educational attainment. Now I'm going to finish up by something, with something that's a slightly different um, thought about these same kind of issues. I'm going to talk about the concept of appropriating, which is really a grant of money to spend on a particular activity, against the concept of purchasing, which is an expenditure of money to secure a specific outcome. So you buy a car, and you have a pretty clear idea of how long it's going to last, 10, 12, 14 years. You've got a fair idea of what it's going to cost, and you've got a fair idea of how much gas it's going to use, and what kind of comfort you're going to get out of it. So you have some pretty specific expectations. A grant of money is more like thinking about the days when your parents used to give you pocket money. And they sort of expected that you were going to save it, but knew pretty well you were going to spend it in the candy store or somewhere else. While governments have worked for a long period of time on the idea of appropriating or a grant of money to spend on a, different, uh, a specific activity, without any real accountability for the end result, I was Minister of Employment for a period of time. 
This is what the Ministry of Employment looked like when I became the minister. It was a chaotic mess. They actually thought that their job was to fix unemployment. That's not a factor of microeconomic activity. It's a factor of macroeconomic activity and some microeconomic activity. It was impossible for uh, this ministry to be able to fix that problem. So that was the first issue that needed to be addressed. We used to fund it on the basis of giving it an allocation of money, 60 million, and then we'd specify each program that it could spend money on. 20 million on Job Plus, 15 million on Restart, uh, 5 million on placement services, so much on counselling, and then another 15 million on a, an additional 30 programs. Uh, when you actually looked at these in terms of how good were they at placing people into work, it looked like the study we did of vocational training in the United States. Some of them were good, most of them were really bad. So one of the things that I did was that, realizing that all we could get was 40,000 people into work for this, uh, and that 30 of the 34 programs that we had didn't work, I canceled 30 of those programs and decided that we would put the resources into the four that worked, but under a different arrangement. The department now had a clear view. What its job was to, was to improve the employability of unemployed people. Think about that. Improve the employability of unemployed people. That's something you can actually do. Part of it is that you match them up with the jobs that are available. Part of it is that you provide them with some work experience because employers are very much um, influenced by how recently it was that you were working. If you haven't worked for two years, don't care what your degrees are, the likelihood of you getting a job are pretty close to zero. Um, we looked at what were the marketable skills we could develop uh, and we looked at how you would repair social problems not being able to get out of bed in the morning, not being able to turn up five days a week, uh, not being able to respond in an appropriate manner to being given directions, whatever it might be, and dealing with things like addictions to drugs and alcohol and all sorts of other problems. We still had this appropriation of 60 million, but we now bought, by way of a purchase contract with the department, the placement of 120,000 people this is three times as many into work. It now specified that 56% of them had to be long-term unemployed, 25% of them had to be our native Maori people, 14% of them people with disabilities, 7% of them people with um, social problems. The programs had to be available all across the country, but they had to concentrate in the areas of highest need. In the first year, we got 135,000 people into work by using this approach. Uh, it was much more equitable in that we were concentrating on the things of greatest need. The long-term unemployed are much harder to place than short-term unemployed. If you've been unemployed less than six months, you'll find a job reasonably easily. If it's been longer than six months, then it's going to be much more difficult. What I've been talking to you about is sort of the ideas of proactive thinking. Uh, I'm a practitioner rather than uh, a theorist. This is a quote from Milton Friedman and I think it's particularly appropriate and it says only in a crisis actual or perceived uh, produces real change. When that crisis occurs the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That I believe is our basic function to develop alternatives to existing policies to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. That, in my view, is the scenario that we see right at the moment. Are the many things sitting on the shelf ready to use right now? Some, but not enough. Before we get into major tax reform in the United States, we need to have more ideas sitting on the shelf ready to use. When the opportunity comes, it's too late to do the research. It needs to be done beforehand. Uh, and then you need to motivate what I call the banner carriers, the people who are going to be able to carry those ideas, help build together the, the coalition of people who will action them and support them as they go through that action environment. During that period of time, we saw um, our country go from being 
one of the poorest performing economies in the whole of the OECD, to being one of the best. If you look at the Freedom Index today, New Zealand's number three or four in that Freedom Index. We got rid of a whole lot of the regulations that were barriers to investment. We went from, when I was Minister of Employment, an unemployment rate of 11.9% down to an unemployment rate of 3%. We went from growth rates of about 1% to 1.5% to growth rates of about 4 to 5% per annum. We went from 23 years of deficit financing to 18 years of surpluses. What I'm saying to you is that the changes are possible. It's not really rocket science. We want people like you who, sit, who think logically, come to sound, sensible conclusions, and then have the courage to force them through. Thank you, everybody, and I'm happy to take your questions. I would like to ask a, I would like to ask a question about uh, the um, interest groups and the pressure groups that might have opposed some of these radical changes. And uh, it just seems to me that when you're dealing with public employee unions and, and various entrenched groups that benefit from the status quo, it becomes very difficult to change the status quo. Uh, I know you mentioned the role that a crisis plays in this, but uh, do we really have to wait for a crisis? Uh, how did you manage the, um, I guess, the, the interest groups uh, that, that might have opposed these changes? Okay, good question, Dale. The answer to that really requires me to set some of the scene. At the time when we started these reforms in New Zealand, New Zealand had compulsory unionism. That meant that 78% of the entire nation's work workforce belonged to unions and unions were the negotiator of their wages, salaries, and terms and conditions of employment. We worked our way through that by negotiation. We never used the power of the government to overturn a contract uh, or to set aside provisions that were put in place. We were hard-nosed, certainly, but it was done by negotiation. And in the end, many of the unions realized that we were talking about the opportunity of either jobs or no jobs, rather than their own secular interest. Uh, so I think that's part of the, the criteria. The second thing is um, never start on a course of action unless you know you can take it through to the conclusion. And once you start on that course of action, never veer away from getting to that uh, final outcome. Once we made a decision that we were going to do something, that was non-negotiable. How we did it and how quickly we did it was something that we were prepared to listen to advice on uh, and to change if that seemed to be a wise thing to do. Uh, but it is important that people realize that leadership is about getting things done. Uh, there's a great American philosopher that I really appreciate. His name is called Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> and, and his catchphrase is, get it done. Well, that's it. You've got to get it done. And uh, I think that there's too little of that, that uh, people waiting around trying to, to find a situation where you have uh, a majority of support before you start. Leadership is about starting when you have a minority of support and building that support as you go along and getting the job done and people afterwards saying, hey, that worked out pretty well. It's not a matter of waiting until everybody's lined up because it's never going to happen. Uh, Maurice, obviously the literacy rates, the education performance increased quite dramatically uh, under your watch. Uh, I'm curious what you're looking forward to in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years of strategic planning now to develop those ideas that are on the shelf that, God forbid, should a crisis come globally or even in your own backyard, what are you doing to help keep continuing to raise the bar and keeping your economy moving forward. Uh, for those who were in the room last night, I think that Michael Cox answered that question. Uh, and the question really focuses on 
what are going to be the opportunities for developed economies in the future, and they're going to be the highly developed intellect opportunities. It's going to be more in the services industry than in manufacturing. It's going to be in the creative areas of activity uh, rather than in the mundane services. And those are areas where the United States has good opportunity and um, I think can still be uh, the world leader in those areas. Trying to go back to where you were 30, 50, and 80 years ago is a calamitous decision. The East Coast of the United States is never, ever going to be the center of the textile trade again. Just forget it. Go on to the next thing, whatever that might be. Uh, and I think that the evolution of societies tells us that what happens is that uh, as societies grow, the jobs move up the value chain, and they require different skills, and preparing for those different skills, I think, is one of the challenges. Uh, I've heard commentary from a few places that Notre Dame University is looking at putting together maybe a billion dollars to invest in being one of these centers for nanotechnology. That's forward-looking, in my view. It's going to be one of the areas of the future. And that kind of thinking, I think, is going to be one of the things that will take us forward. Uh, I was in Canada for much of the period of the 90s when you saw the dot-com boom in the United States. During that decade of the 90s, we saw a massive level of investment from all around the world into the American economy. And it happened because people, for the first time, were starting to put a monetary value on brain power. And they were recognizing that the United States was the place where that brain power existed, and it had the universities that were most likely to be able to create it. That's the future, in my view, looking to those kind of things. Does it happen in other areas? Yes, it does. Uh, I came from agriculture. One of the things that we did in 1985 was that we stripped away from agriculture all of the farm subsidies. Uh, and we did it quickly. Over a period of nine months, then all of the subsidies went in total. In 1985, the New Zealand dairy industry produced 35 products from milk. Last year, it produced 2,200 products from milk. And that's because it is now totally focused on what their customers' needs are rather than how you qualify for the subsidy payment. And because they do that, they get marginal increases in value because they're offering additional benefits. That, I think, is the way forward. Um, what are the products of the future going to look like? And one of the things that we don't recognize properly about subsidies uh, or whatever you like to call them, special tax concessions, uh, whatever the name might be. What those things do is that they kill innovation and they create complacency. You have to take those away and make people face the marketplace and then they will be incredibly innovative and creative. One of the worst experiences in my period of living in the United States was the debate around health reform. And everybody was talking about how uh, America had a bad health system. Except they measured that in terms of access rather than the efficacy of care. And so does the rest of the world. The best health system in the world for the efficacy of care is the United States. If you're a male in Britain, over the age of 45, you have 614% more likelihood of dying of prostate cancer than living in the United States. If you're a female living in Canada, the likelihood of dying from breast cancer is 16 to 18% higher than the United States. Yet the health system in Canada is ranked as number one of the best in the world and America as number 35. We've got to get away from stupid thinking you know, what really counts is, if I'm sick, can you make me better? That's number one. Over the last 35 years, 
The Nobel Prize in Medicine has been won by people in the United States 30 times. Over the last three decades, the major discoveries in pharmaceuticals, 85% of them have happened in the United States. That's driven by a market system that rewards investment risk-taking uh, and reward in the end by creating whatever it is as the new miracle drug. Getting those things right is really the secret to the future. Anybody else? Why would you give up farming? Why am I not farming? Yeah. Well, I'm too darned old. <laughs> you know, farming is something that's good until you're about 50. But frankly, um, in my middle 40s I went into Parliament. I had never any real ambition to be a politician. But in the, at that time, uh, the future of New Zealand looked so bleak that many of us got together and decided that we either change the way in which our country operates or we better go live somewhere else. Uh, so we got together a group of people and uh, it happened in both the, the Conservative Party and, and the Socialist Party at the same time and we made massive changes. Now most of us went there without any intention of staying there long. Get the job done and leave. I like those kind of politicians. I want the person who says, I don't really want to come here, but I'll come and do what's necessary and then I'm going to leave. Um, and frankly, if you, are, if you go into the political arena and you can't make your contribution in less than 10 years, you should never have started, or at the end of 10 years you should leave and let somebody else have a go. Uh, it's something where you can be productive and creative for a period of time, but it's not a lifetime um, career. Yes, sir. Um, you just briefly commented on uh, second ago during the dot-com era how people around the world sort of went into the United States. I was wondering how you feel about the United States education system now, and if you were in charge, what changes would you make? Uh, the biggest risk to the United States education system, in my view, is that um, the raw material going into the universities is not good enough for you to be able to hold your standing in the rest of the world. And it's incredibly urgent that there's some, uh, some action taken to improve the quality of the raw material going in. There are too many young people going into universities who can't read or write or properly comprehend or do calculus or basic science or anything like that. I got a friend in Washington State who has a, who has a solution for that. Um, and his solution uh, I find very intriguing. And that is that if you arrive at university and you need remedial work in any area, then the school that you came from has to pay for those remedial classes. I think the problem would disappear very quickly if that happened. <laughs> so that, I think, uh, your universities are still great, you still have great tutors, but the raw material is not as good as it used to be. And uh, frankly, the competition from places like China and India uh, is becoming more and more intense uh, all the time because they realize uh, that intellectual capability and capacity is going to be um, the wealth component of the future. How do you feel about the charter schools in the United States? I feel good, there's just not enough of them. Because effectively what we did was create every school in the country into a charter school on the same day. And uh, that's about being able to give people choice, uh, being able to um, allow some freedom in terms of how you teach. Uh, one of the things that we did is that the block grants that go from the government to the school have no strings attached. You can teach by, by whatever mechanism that you want, except these are the core curriculum subjects and you have to teach those for 75 percent of the time. Uh, allowing that flexibility I think is really important. I don't know what's the best way of teaching. In fact, I don't think there is a singular best way of teaching. I think that some different forms of teaching work better for some students than for others. So we better have a multiplicity of systems so that it will meet the demands of the individuals 
You know, I'm not going to say that the Socratic method is the best of all um, because it will work for some and it won't work for others. We better have the flexibility to see that we can find a system that gets the best that we can out of each of the individuals. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you.